Okay, hi everyone, welcome to the Embrace Theatre's Day of Decolonisation. Uh, I'm Maddie, I'm the workshop coordinator, so I'll be sort of running a little Q&A session where we talk about um, decolonising the theatre and how to improve access and make it generally a better place for uh, racial minorities to um, sort of live, work and enjoy. Uh, so I've got Isaiah and CJ here, um, who are both members of Slutco. Um, if you want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what you do. Uh, yeah. Hello, I'm Isaiah, he can pronouns. I'm a math student at the University of Sheffield. I was involved with, because I'm not perfect yet, a piece of student writing in my first semester in uni, and I've been involved with SUPAS, the other performing arts theatre society as well, as well as doing lots of theatre before I came to university. And obviously, this is just a topic I'm very interested in, and interested in helping Sutco be better at. Uh, and I am CJ. Uh, I'm currently uh, Projects and Workshops uh, manager, I don't know, Projects and Workshops guy uh, for Sutco. I did a radio play, uh, The Importance of Being Somewhat Earnest uh, over the summer. But other than that, I, I would say I'm still relatively new, relatively fresh to, to, to the whole Sutco crowd. Though I did do a show with Supas, which was fun. Mm -hmm. So oh, um, we've, got of, oh, <laughs> we've got a couple of questions here that um, uh, we're going to sort of go through and discuss, um, talking about making it, um, making Sutco a more kind of accessible society and also the experience of being black in, in the theatre scene in general. Um, so the first question that we're going to go through is, what was access to theatre like for both of you? From the beginning, from Sutco, and also from when you were younger. I, you know, um, it was good. Like, I mean, I came from a place. I'm London based, um, which is the hub of 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 theatre, according to the the general zeitgeist. You know, um, a show's done successfully if it's gone to London, things like that. Um, and I was also in a very underprivileged area, which meant that my local theatre, which you know, I was blessed for my local my three local theatres to be the Southwark Playhouse, the Young Vic, and the National Theatre, uh, which were all theatres that hosted, um, yeah, I know, uh, you know, luck of m where my mother gave birth to me. Um, and uh, and though they all had programmes that, that, you know, meant that I was able to see shows very often um, and meant that I, you know, I was able to do theatre and, and, and I, you know, I've, I've been, I've been at the, the Southwark Playhouse's Young Company since I was 14. Um, doing a crap ton of shows there, acting there. Um, and so, you know, to, to some degree, to begin with, you know, in such a multicultural environment that was London in general and, and that place in general, I didn't really see race and that, that only changed a bit later, but I'll let Isaiah jump in. Yeah, I was also born and bred in London so yeah, whoop whoop, it was great. Um, West London, I'd say access to theatre, hmm, seeing productions was kind of a once a year thing with my family, like I was lucky growing up, my uncle's an actor, so we did speak a lot about, but I'd say film is more accessible when it comes to actually seeing, seeing like things, like we watched a lot of film and stuff together, but theatre was kind of a special occasion. Um, when it comes to interacting with theatre myself, I'd say in school, it definitely was tainted by race. I think there's ways that people can cast you, um, especially teachers, that you get to know from a very young age that race is a bias for them but it wasn't like too bad for me at the time because I didn't really care I was just enjoying myself but yeah I'd say then the older I got and more I pushed to do like cheaper summer projects um with my mum because it was like I was like oh can I do this and she was like yeah that's basically cheap childcare. you audition and if you get in you just get to like produce a musical and it's great um, but the older you get, the more you realise, uh, even in a place like London, I could very easily be like one of the only black people in a cast. Um, even when I got involved with 
friends of mine's um, youth companies that they had started themselves. It's very easy again to be like one of the two black people in a cast. Um, and yeah, and definitely when I came to Sutco, especially coming from London to a place like Sheffield, um, it the access was there because I was a th theatre kid who went looking for the theatre company, but I definitely felt like an outsider as I was, as CJ was not yet a part of Sutco, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was the only black in the village for a while. Um, yes. And that did you, quite isolated. Uh, did, did you do any, any auditions um, for random things, uh, kind of, <clears throat> pardon me, um, but in London or, or here? Like, have you done any auditions outside of the kind of the Sutco or, or the summer school experience? I have, but they tend to be like, I don't know if I do, auditions outside of this have been a bit better, I'd say. Uh, Sutco is a, a, is what it is. And things I'd be auditioning for outside of this would be like queer specific. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so. It was no, they, they're they're groups that already like have integration and yes, like exactly. inclusivity in mind. No, that's because um, I, I wanted. To, I, I I've not spoken to anybody about this experience, and you just like literally unlocked a memory. Um, so when I was eleven, I uh, I got an agent through part miracle, part exploitation, part you know <laughs> uh, what happens. No, but there are, there are like, you know, advice to anybody ever thinking about acting, research your, your agency and don't jump on the first person who's like, yeah, uh, we want this little mixed race kid to come in and do different things. Um, Cause it was, you know, the audition process is it, you were, you're already treating people like cattle, moving them in and out and just like scanning them to see if they work and then pumping them mm. uh, away into, into a production. And I remember um, being 11 and it would be a system of like my like any every single show that was okay cool there's like a, there's a there's a small mixed race child a black child we're gonna send him up and it didn't matter whether I was good for it it didn't matter whatever uh, I did Lion King and and uh, and um, Thriller and the Bodyguard and anything that was that they could do they would they would do it for whilst they were also taking my money and charging me for for you know signing contracts and um and for headshots and everything else and all these things that that are a part of the system and cost a lot of money um although do not sign with an agency that asks you to pay them before they give you a job just to think uh that does not exist but it was it was that feeling of whenever going there i'm not going there because you think I'm good. I'm being mm. sent there because I fit a, I fit a series of descriptives. Um, and it got to the point where I remember um, the older I got, like I stayed in, I kept that, I, that agent I, I, I left after a year and then I got another agent uh, when I was about 17, 16, it was the same. In that, uh, I remember going to an audition and this is the last thing I'll say, um, and we couldn't find the door. And so we're walking up and down this street and then I see a kid who looks just like me, but you know, slight different facial features also walking down the street. There are about five of us, that was four, five of us, um, little body doubles going up and down, up and down, up and down, not knowing where this door is. And suddenly we're like, I think we're all going to the same place. And it is this, part of it is like, you know, the way the industry is tailored. Um, but it, we do, when you start and you focus on the aesthetics, I think you do get into this boxing people in. Mm. Um, because me and these five other people, really, when you, you know, we, we, we luckily got to sit and have some talking, because uh, I just can't sit in silence. Um, and really, there's nothing similar about us. I watched some of them act. Our acting styles weren't very different. Um, I eventually met the boy who, who got the role that I didn't get. Damn it. Um, and we were very different in, in, in all sort of forms. And um, I, like that, that is, I think, a real hindrance is when people really focus on the aesthetics. Mm. 
-hmm. like like Sorry. you know a white role is just like any role mm. but a specifically black role is a specifically black role and that's it yes yes um and it's even i think i've seen in forms like i think you're more likely to get a a white role that is very vague in its descriptives than a role for a person of color uh, because they, they're always, you know, we have this very specific vision. It's, you know, it's a grizzled um, young thug who's going to find his true heart and, and he's going to fall in love and eventually try to rise out of a project. Um, all of that shite. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so to sort of move on from that, how do you think we should be decolonizing theatre? Like, in, in your eyes, what would be the ideal? That we would be aiming for. Don't worry if if, if you haven't got like a, a solid answer for that because it's quite a big question. But um, yeah, sort of in theory, what do you think we could be doing? I'd say think about first the plays you put forward and stuff like that, because in the theatre canon there are a lot of colonizers. I don't mean that literally. To be colonized is a state of mind and there are a lot of colonizers who you could pick and be like i love their writing style yet the writing style just is seeped with patriarchy and colonial racist ideas and it's like some people are great writers yes but if someone's telling you are oh, like babes like <laughs> like the only good characters are the white men the women are either a mum whore or a ingenue and the people of colour are, are literal like stereotypes it's like mm. maybe they're not the best writer it's, you know? I know like, I, I almost want to say because when people say decolonize uh, when people say like, oh, let's decolonize the curriculum, let's stop teaching, because um, I, I agree with that, I, I very much do, and I, I was about to, what I was about to say kind of sounds like it's a disagreement, it's not. Um, well, but when people say decolonize, they're like, okay, let's stop teaching uh, Kipling, let's stop talking about Kipling in our education. But I, I think there needs to, there needs to almost be to decolonize, we need to recolonize our literature, but not colonize it from a particularly British um, uh, perspective. There does need to be, before we get to the point of saying, oh my God, we're so post-racial, um, that we need to acknowledge um, the actual racial history. Um, you know, before we can start running around and going, oh my God, look how great we are, we need to, experience plays that discuss race in some capacity um and that you know it's that is very hard to do in a in a in a majoritively white society yeah. uh, that is understandable but that does not mean there are not plays that discuss race from a particularly white perspective um this is england is a brilliant um uh, one-man show that's just that, that um just finished uh, at the National Theatre before we went into, into lockdown, and that is a discussion of race from a white perspective. Um, and, 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 you know, do your research, find more, write your own. Um, that, that I don't know, if, I, I don't know if, if, if it's been the same for you, but as somebody who writes, you know, I've, I, it's, it's so much harder to try to craft a play that is about the issues faced by people of colour. Um, without any people of color in it or without a limited number of people with a limited mm. number of people of color in it. Um, I tried. Proposing it was so complex because you're trying to discuss complex ideas and then do that from a perspective that isn't even from the, the people being oppressed. Um, and I found myself, you know, tripping over political phrases and terminology to the extent to which I think it, it dis disconnected and, and people weren't engaged enough as it is going like, look, I've got a play. You know, and this is this is where there's a term, really funny term. Do stop me if I keep on talking on for too long, um, which is like um, the race Olympics. Um, it's not you know commonly used. It's no academic thing, but it's about like almost a competition of who is more oppressed. Mm. Uh, and I think to some extent it's crap. Like you know, don't engage in it. But to some extent, when you like you you look at the degrees to which things um affect different groups it is a lot easier for us to put on a play that is like oh my gosh the issues faced by lgbtq plus people are really hard because 
the society is diverse and, and full of, of LGBTQ plus people. And so to sit there and to discuss those topics is a lot easier. Um, and so I think we almost, we almost fail to look elsewhere for mm. topics of conversation um, because we feel like, you know, pat on the back, we've done our job. We've done our, our leftist, um, yeah, our, our duty. Leftist, yeah. <laughs> we, here's our political play. We've got that play in this, in this section of, of the, uh, the program. He heck it. Sorry. Am I allowed to swear? Can I swear? No, just shake your head. I Maddie. think we're trying to avoid swearing as much as possible. Okay. okay. I, I hope I haven't swear. sworn. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, no, we'll I get, agree. We'll get the new editor to leave him out now. <laughs> yeah, no, decolonization isn't just about changing what plays you do. It's, like I said, de being colonised is a state of mind. And the first step to decolonization is to realise that we are all colonised, we all have colonised minds. Um, and then for our white viewers at home, I'd say the next step is to not centre your guilt we are all colonized oh. we all have colonized minds and the theater and the arts are things that have typically been reserved for the upper classes so therefore decolonization has yet to touch some of the arts that i hold most dear theater it has touched a bit musical theater mm, opera <laughs> Definitely oh. not. We're still doing <laughs> Madam Butterfly in yellow face. But, <laughs> you know, like, because the arts has been, like, held on by the upper classes, they have not wanted to examine their most beloved works um, because they haven't wanted to examine themselves. And that's another thing that made me feel very outsider-ish in Sutko because there were incidents with my cast where people would be using, I'll just say slurs. And these were slurs that I had not previously heard because people weren't using them in London and they weren't against my people. And then when I was told they were slurs, immediately I seemed to be the only one who would call out the person in the cast in the company who would be using these slurs. And it's almost as if the white people what in that room- slurs? Huh? It was, it was a term for people- what, what sort of slurs? Racial, kind of like ethnic. Let's okay. just, I don't want to trigger anyone at home. Okay. Everyone should be able to watch this. I'm not going to repeat what was said because as soon as I heard it was a slur, I said, let me call it out let me stand in solidarity with people who aren't in this room. Yet everyone who was of the same race as this person seemed to feel like it wasn't their call, it wasn't their fight, it, they wouldn't say anything. And that's one thing that made me feel quite unsafe. And for me, I wouldn't even mind if Sutko was doing racist plays every day of the week with a twist. It's honestly, I'd prefer for them to decolonize their minds first. And then we can get on to, oh, maybe we shouldn't do Shakespeare because this is a bit sexist. That's all lip service. That's lip service. Do you know what I mean? You need to create, you need to create decolonized, like welcoming places for our Gypsy Roma and traveling community, for our black, for the black community, for like people of color, for Jewish people. Like we've all seen and heard things happen in Sutko that have made people uncomfortable and it made it made me uncomfortable and I wasn't even being targeted and I'd say just call out your friends like that for me would do a million things more than having a matrix <laughs> where they say we need to have a black writer this term and we need to have a, a female writer this term I don't know no, 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 no. If well, y'all don't want yeah, to research into interesting <laughs> black playwrights, I don't care. I'll just be at home reading Jeremy O'Harris. Like, I'll be at home reading, like, reading the contemporaries of this day, but 
I'd say first decolonize your minds and that would make the society a much better place and by virtue of decolonizing your mind you would just naturally be better at <laughs> directing and producing and engaging with works that would be more inclusive yeah Well, that's the biggest thing I misunderstand, or not misunderstand, that I that, that escapes me, is how in an art form that is so concerned with language and with the power of language and the, the like, the hist histor um, historical meaning of the words that we say, that people aren't more clued in, um, and that's like you know a circular thing, but also a wider thing of like you know, I've heard and it's mad. I've heard the term, and, and it's not a, it's not a recognised derogatory phrase, but the term uppity used in general conversation without people acknowledging the history of that term. I mean, relatively speaking, nobody in, in, in this society has any right to say that somebody is speaking above their general, like, you know, level of, of whatever, you know, speaking up Class, um, to, to like people they should be to. Um, yeah, thank you. But, but still, like, understand that it's not it's not just about racial slurs both in general dialogue and then in theater it is about how you can i mean and it's about you know going to somebody and seeing them uh, you know eventually it's going to somebody and seeing them as, as as something more than their race i remember i had somebody coming to me uh first conversation i think we had they were like hey uh black panther great movie right uh, you know it's it's <laughs> It's it's a white like, and I think this is where this is where this is where the white people have trouble. Um, <laughs> is that there is a lot, there is a lot to think about. You know, there is a lot to 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 the language that you use and how you say things to people. But also, we need to be engaging with that stuff more. We can't just be like, oh, like, and this is why I asked what the slur was. And I understand the general, under, like the reasoning for not saying it. I could say I who don't... it's against, but I yeah, yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. It was against like gypsy, Roma, and traveller people. That's why I like centred them there because it wasn't something I had heard in London or like about people. But as soon as I was told it was a slur, I was confused as to why people were kind of letting it go then with the whole ah ha ha kind of. <laughs> mentality it was odd it was an uncomfortable place to be because I felt like they felt just because they weren't saying a slur to me like I must have felt in their gang but as someone who fundamentally believes in solidarity and if you just look at the structure of white supremacy if you don't respect the Roma people who are facing struggles in Europe and across the world to this day I'm not going to then think that you're, you respect me if, like, if we want to bring it back to personal or, or black struggle. And I don't really think that's something that anyone on the company fully understood at that time. So. Well, I don't, I, I, but I, my, my, what I'm uh, almost arguing is that I think sometimes we are afraid to say things how they are, that in discussions of, um of race and discussions of of issues facing different peoples we often use euphemisms uh we often uh kind of skirt around the impact of it in order to not make people uncomfortable and part of that is not making the people who are being uh disrespected and and people who are being um uh who are being targeted uncomfortable uncomfortable but i also know just from conversations with my flatmate that if if i were to have a conversation with him and openly use the n-word and you know using a euphemism there in a way that wasn't saying it to somebody in a way that wasn't targeting somebody but in a way that was saying this is a word that exists and is used that makes him uncomfortable and the reason that makes him uncomfortable as a white man is because it reminds him of oh so how how evil hit like you know the ancestors were and i think sometimes we we disallow pe uh, people who aren't of color white people to feel that sense of both shame and discomfort at the big people by, by kind of, you know, pandying around. Um, and, and, you know, this isn't a time where I think we are allowed to, 
and this is, uh, people can disagree with me and I think they have the right to, but I don't think this is a time where we're allowed to feel uncomfortable. Sorry, allowed to feel comfortable because it's uncomfortable for us as people of color. It's uncomfortable for people who are oppressed by the economic system. It is not a time to say, oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we'll, we'll discuss this in, in, a, in a better way because clearly this makes you uncomfortable. I, you know, I work in with an organization. Sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop after this one little bit. But I work with organizations that um, that um, combat public sexual harassment, and sometimes we discuss topics of, ra uh, of, of, of rape and, and sexual assault. And to some extent, yes, I agree. We need to protect people and, and keep people who are victims of sexual harassment um, and don't have to force them to relive that experience. But also, by not discussing just how awful that feels by not telling stories openly and publicly we limit the extent to which people can empathize with their experiences and i think by sometimes not saying just outright saying yeah you called me this or yeah this person said this um by not outright saying it we disallow what people of the people who aren't of color white people from feeling that sense of discomfort and changing their behavior I understand where you're coming from, and if anyone in Sutco or outside of Sutco wants me to say the N-word at them, like they're white, come see me. If you see me on campus, that's a that's a service I'll provide. But as like I wouldn't mind, but the term I was speaking about, seeing as it had nothing to do with any community I was a part of, the most I'd be willing to do would be spell it out because I personally because I actually didn't research it, so that's on me for not doing all my solidarity work. But the most I'd be willing to do is spell it out because it's not my place to say, to reclaim. Do you know what I mean? And yes, I understand, like, we should be what making it, people, people feel like... I do think there should be space for people to feel uncomfortable. Like, I understand what you mean when you say, like, we kind of skirt around issues. But that's kind of what trigger warnings are for. Just to say, like, if anyone's been affected by that, this trigger warning I'm going to talk about, um, rape, trigger warning I'm going to talk about this, people, like, wait a bit, people can leave if they like, and then you speak the truth to the people who mentally can take it at the time and won't be triggered by that. And I mean triggered in the... Um, What's it in the medical psychological sense, not in the mean yeah. sense? <laughs> but yeah, no, um, I, I, I was going to ask you. I was going to ask your thoughts on language, but I think I I have a strong feeling of like that more theater, specifically more theater in Sukko needs to be political. I don't care whether it's specifically about race, but I think for us to start having more conversations, we can't waste hours of somebody's actual sitting time uh, but then also like lots of time in production for shows that aren't saying anything um and i, I wondered i wondered your general opinion on that sorry I'm Maddie, sure it's okay. just... <laughs> just <laughs> yeah i mean it's student theater it should be political it's kind of boring if and being a part of student writing i have seen people try political theater and i applaud that CJ. And I applaud that. So, um, you know. It doesn't it. always have to be done well as long as we're trying, is what it's Yeah, like. yeah. That it's student theatre. Like, I do understand yeah. what you're saying. And um, <laughs> last semester before coronavirus took everything away from us, uh, we got to see a great political piece called, I've literally forgotten it. The Pillow Man, which, you know, it was made that you political? I think it was a bit political. I think it was a bit what political. It, it at least made you think. A totalitarian oh. government. I'm not sure you could really remove the politics from that. Yeah. And that's another thing where it's like, I'd say I applauded the directors because I think um, it was done as well as it could have been. Did I have problems with the text? Do I think the text was a bit colonized? Yeah, in the way that it, <laughs> in the way that it treated um, its one disabled character? Yes, because it wasn't accurate and like, it just didn't make sense. But, 
that was the text and the way that it was delivered was done quite well actually they took a piece of text that yes it was written by some white dude who's not disabled who wanted to make a commentary but didn't really make that character logically make sense for anyone who knew anything about disability they took that text and they made a commentary and they made that commentary well 